<laughs> Amen, church. That is a, a rhythm of the motherland. Right? When we hear this song, I mean, you just like, you feel like the Lord is coming today. Amen. Amen. And, then, and then the way Jeremy does that, it's like, man, bro, you should go to Africa with me, Jeremy. And I, I was, that was cool, man. So I'm looking around in the fellowship, and people are struggling with hum. Um, some people were beating their chest so hard, they were about to cough. I'm like, no, don't kill yourself. You know, you don't have to do hum. You just, just do hum. Uh, it's such a great privilege to be able to be with the church over here in Phoenix. Uh, my wife and I, uh, we are very thankful, very much thankful to the church for your warm welcome uh, from the airport, uh, you know, to all the venues, the, the, the college that we had to visit, and all the houses that they were able to go to, and uh, Chris and his lovely wife, Darby, and having that party yesterday night was so amazing. But I was thinking, I mean, I, I saw Chris cooking all those ribs and salmons and smoke what, I don't know, all kind of stuff. I'm like, how am I going to go to church tomorrow morning? Yeah. And because he knows that I love milkshake, he was like, okay, bro, I'm going to make you a milkshake that you will never forget. And he did. Now I'm in trouble because I used to go to in and out to get my milkshake, and I thought that was the best. Now that I've tested that one, and it's homemade. So I'm going to be in trouble when I go back to California. How am I going to do to have another one? Uh, it's been amazing to be able to be with Jeremy and uh, Amy. Uh, just in three days, I think we have built a friendship that will last forever. And we always see each other at conferences. And uh, thank you so much for inviting us over. I feel like I have a friend, a good friend in you now, bro. Uh, thank you so much to the whole church. You are amazing. Marvel, great campus leader. I mean, uh, we had a chance to spend the time with John and Julia, uh, Chris' parents. Uh, that was, thank you so much for making that time. Uh, it, was, it was brilliant and uh, I can't wait to take you to Africa. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, what an incredible privilege, Father, to be in your kingdom. It feels so good to have you as our dad. We can go to you at any moment. No matter what you're doing, Lord God, you will always have a time to listen to our voice. And we know sometimes we don't know what to say, Father. We don't know how to pray. We don't know how to love you. But God, you still welcome us, embrace us, Father, give us directions. And from time to time, you even give us a little spanking. Just, Father, to really help us to focus on what is the most important? Loving you, loving you, and loving you again. And this morning, Father, thank you so much for the amazing chance and opportunity to be able, Father, to fellowship with my brothers and sisters in Phoenix. Thank you, Father, for the incredible leadership of Jeremy and Amy, Father, the, the great shepherding of uh, uh, Chris and Darby, Father, and all the house church leaders and Bible leaders and all the servants and every single disciple in the church. Father, they all mean a lot to you. Today, Father, I don't even know how to communicate what you've put on my heart. God, I do believe that you can use me, Father, even though I'm not worthy, to absolutely, Father, speak your words to your people so that we can all leave this hall completely transformed ready to surrender more, Lord God, to your lordship and leadership. Father, thank you so much because you can bring the best out of every single one in this room. Thank you for the incredible dreams that you have for 2015. We are ready for the march and for the charge. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. We use this uh, book as a key book for our workshop and uh, and I'm really fired up and excited and inspired by all the preachers and speakers during the workshop. It was amazing. Philippians chapter 3. Let's read from verse 7. Come on, please. But whatever were against me, and I consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more? I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. 
for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having the righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is true faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to which the prize, to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Amen. This is amazing. As I'm reading this, I'm trying to picture myself in the Apostle Paul's situation. As you read this, you might have the impression that he's preaching or he's sitting in the garden of the saints telling them about Jesus and focusing their heart on heaven. But unfortunately, that was not the case. He's writing this letter from a dark jail and cell of the Roman first century prison. His hands are not free. His feet are locked in stocks. He's in a dark dungeon. And when you think about jail in the first century, living in this society today, you might not have a clear picture of what Paul is going through. All the sufferings, all the abuse, right? Over here in America, when you go to jail, I mean, jail in America, when I see people complaining about going to jail, and I've seen documentaries about jails in America, it looks like a five-star hotel in some of the country in Africa. And I see people in jail, what are they doing in jail? Oh, they're doing gym, you know, they're walking out. In jail? They're walking out, lifting weights and watching TVs in jail. And they have breakfast? Breakfast, you know, donuts in jail, hot dogs. Now, in Africa, and you're in jail, you are a dead dog. You don't have hot dogs, hamburgers, and you know, and, and some people in jail over here in the United States, they still go to school, you know, and they're working on their degree, but they're in jail. I'm like, please put me over there for the rest of my life. You see, that's why when you, when you read the Bible, for you to really grasp the meaning of what the Holy Spirit is trying to convey through some of these people in their own environment, you have to really study deeply and go back to the first century culture so that you can understand where Paul is coming from to write this. He's suffering, he's in pain. And he said, no matter what, I used to consider again. Because he was very bright, he was very smart. He was from a very great culture, race. He was a Jewish man. He went to rabbinic schools. He was one of the most finest Hebrews young men. And he used to be part of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Council. And after he became a disciple by discovering Jesus, he went, everything else that used to matter for me, I consider that a garbage compared to the greatness, the amazing grace of knowing Jesus Christ. Come on. And he says, because I know Jesus and I have an heavenly call. I'm going to heaven and heaven is going to be so amazing that I'd rather lose anything on earth that can keep me from being there in the last days. Amen. So, what about my failures in Christ? What about my weaknesses? What about all the mistakes that I'm making? 
I'm not gonna let my past trap me and hold me back. I'm gonna fight every day to forget what is behind me and to move forward and to keep running the race until that day when I can embrace Jesus and share his resurrection. That's all that matter. Question, is that really what that matter for you? Going to heaven? When was the last time you thought about heaven? Why are you here this morning? Reading the Bible? Coming to church? What are you depriving yourself of selfish pleasures and worldly pleasures and desires? Why are you a disciple of Jesus? Why do we preach this gospel at the expense of our own lives? Why do I have to go to Congo? Why do I have to go to places where civil wars can just start in one day? Thousands of people are dying. Why would I go to typhoid fever, malaria, I'm a lawyer? Why would I do that? If I did not have something more important than this life to strive for. You see, Paul is saying, I have a goal and I have to reach my goal. And there's a prize waiting for me. And this Christian race is an upward calling. It's a heavenly calling. And for that reason, I press on. The word press on in English. You see, I've tried to study this in English. I press on to reach the end of the race. And press on means to apply pressure on yourself, to push yourself forward. And moving to a higher place, moving to a higher level, moving in a direction from lower to higher. I press on. That's the context. I move, I make progress. You move by applying pressure on yourself. If you're very gentle with yourself, I'm not sure you're gonna make the race. I strain toward, that's what he says, towards the goal, I, I strain myself. To strain toward means to stretch beyond the proper point of limit. To pull yourself with force, to strive hard. I press myself. I want to go to heaven. It takes effort, commitment, boldness, resilience. It takes character to go to heaven. It might not take that much to become a disciple or a Christian. Because it is a decision to turn your back from sin, get baptized. And then now the race starts. Right. You see, the race is a journey. It's not a sprint. Right. It's not how you start. It's how you finish. Yeah. 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 And the problem today is many people die and go in the grave with unfinished dreams. People die and go to graves with talents that have not been explored. They have not invested. And they finish their journey on earth without accomplishing the purpose for which the Lord designed them. A lack, a lack of character will keep you from good things. It's not how you start. It's really how you finish. How many people over here have a lot of unfinished assignments? A lot of dreams that are still there, burning in your heart. You started a relationship, you couldn't go to the end. You're still there, and you have to start all over again. And you go from man to man, from, from lady to lady, and you're trying to make it happen. And you're thinking, the problem is the other people. But the problem is you, if you're like a butterfly going from flower to flower, you should learn to develop character. Come on. You should be committed if you have a purpose. You see, it takes character to go to heaven. That's why, I wonder, that's why. Now I understand. Many are called, but a few will make it. But you see, God is not limiting anyone to go there. God calls a lot of people, but it takes character to walk the walk. Are you walking the walk? Or are you about to start the race? 
You see, today, if we have to embrace Apostle Paul's example, I have a couple of points that will help us to really imitate his heart. And no matter what man, what, no matter what one man can do, another man can do also. He was not an angel. Paul was a man just like you and me. So if Paul can make it, you and I should make it. You say amen. amen. Luke chapter 5. How do you press on toward the goal without quitting? How do you achieve the race? Luke chapter 5. We're going to learn from this history, from this story. Sorry, story and history. They are two different things. Okay. From this story, from the Bible, Luke chapter 5. And let's read from verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got onto one of those boats belonging to Simon and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. You see, these fishermen were having a hard time. They've been fishing all night long without catching anything. And in the morning, they're exhausted, frustrated. And Jesus was there. So he went inside one of this boat belonging to Simon because he had a plan for Simon. So he started teaching the people. And he also went in that boat so that he can get Simon's attention. There was no way for him to run away from Jesus because he needed his boat, right? So he didn't go to Simon, okay, listen to the word of God. He said, hey, sir, can I borrow your boat? Yes, you can do that. Oh, sorry. Can I borrow your boat? Yeah, no problem. And then he's standing in the boat preaching. And you know, when Jesus preaches, he can preach for hours. So you don't want him to stand in your boat if you have other plans. So Simon is there, maybe he's annoyed, he's like, okay, you know, his nays and he's thinking about, okay. And then finally, maybe he resolved to listen. Okay, what is he saying? And Jesus is preaching and preaching and preaching. Repent! The kingdom of God is near! If you do not deny yourself, if you don't love me more than your father, your mother, your son, your, your wife, and all that you have, you cannot be my disciples. He's like, who is this guy? Man, he's so passionate. Nobody ever spoke like that. Who is that guy? And Jesus is preaching. And at the end of this preaching, verse 4, when he had finished speaking, now he turned to Simon. He's going to deal with Simon now. Put out into deep water and let down the net for a catch. Simon was thinking about fishing all night long. He's like, I don't have any money, no income. The fish is not going well. What should I do? Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. You see, he's a professional fisherman. How can you tell him how to fish? How can you tell a professional dancer how to dance? I mean, it's like me going to Michael Jackson, say, wow, you've been dancing all your life, man. Let me show you some moves, Michael. Let me train you. He's going to be like, who are you, Blaze? See what I mean? Imagine me teaching Michael Jackson how to do moonwalk, you know? Like, that, that's not more work. You know what I mean? Some people are trying to learn how to dance, but Michael Jackson is the dance himself. I mean, he feels the dance. And so Peter is a professional fisherman. How can a preacher tell him how to fish? It takes humility, a lot of humility, to be able to listen to somebody who is not supposed to know anything about your profession. You say, man, about that, right? So he said, well, Master, I know you are a rabbi. You probably know the Bible better than me, but I do know a lot of things about fishing. How many times have you tried to lecture God about how your life should be? How many times have you been so frustrated with God because things are not going your way? It's like you, you're like, God, maybe I should have a deep time with you. Let me tell you, let me tell you what I need. All right? I don't know if you're deaf. I don't know if you listen to me, God. I've been telling you, because some of us, that's how our prayer life is. Yeah. We're giving directions to God. Wow. God, I should live in Phoenix until I die. 
and I want to meet a lady from this corner, from Tempe over here, and get married to her and have five kids. Do you understand what I say? This is the kind of job I want. And now you're frustrated like Peter because things have not been going your way. And then now God is trying to tell you how to turn things wrong. And you're like, but I've been trying hard. Why are you not married today? Oh, bro, I don't know, man. I've been going on dates, on dates, on dates, on dates. In Phoenix, in LA, everywhere. Nothing is happening. <laughs> bro, how you not, why are you not bearing fruits? Oh, bro, I don't know. People are not just open in Phoenix. You know, I've tried different strategies, techniques, and methods of evangelism. Nothing is happening. This place is not open. Is that the way you're feeling with your life today? Wow. Nothing is working. Maybe you are in Peter's shoes. Mm. Maybe you're right there where you need an instruction from God. And it takes humility to be able to obey Jesus. You see, said by he was humble enough to say in the last part of verse 5, but because you say so, I've worked hard all night, but because you say so, I will let down the net. You see, miracles will always happen when you make a decision to obey and surrender. Yes. Even when you don't understand, you don't need to understand what God says. You just have to do it because you trust God to be smarter than you, to be more powerful than you, and to be able to make it happen. Amen. Is that the way you are doing? Do you obey the Bible? Or do you argue with God? They had skills, they had nets, they had boats, but they were fruitless. They had the expertise, the infrastructure, but they were fruitless. They caught nothing. They were exhausted. Nothing. Their life was were dry. And when you think it's over, when your experience, when your talents and gift will not lead you where you need to go, when you finally admit that you are powerless, here comes Jesus in your life. Now you can listen to his voice because you can pay attention. When your ways have not worked for you, then you are ready to try God's way. Maybe that's where you are right now today. And Jesus will be right there. He always comes when things are not working, when you're broken, when you're burned out, when you're tired of trying to find peace, hope, and meaning for your life, when you have lost, lost your faith and your purpose. When you are like this woman, bleeding for 12 years, and you spend all that you had to the doctors, and your situation has grown worse, then come red Jesus. Jesus will be there like Elijah. You're running away from a lady that wants to kill you, and you're hiding in a cave. When you're broken and desperate, then you hear the voice of God. Like Agar, Agar, in English, Agar, running away from Sarah and Abraham with a bad son in the desert, and you don't know where to go. Then the angel of the Lord will call you by your name. Are you at that point today? Are you quitting? And then he will show you the way. You see, in this chapter, verse, chapter 5, verse 2, uh, verse 3, the first thing he told Peter was, got, get into one of these boats, Jesus said to Peter, put out a little from shore. You see, that was not a miracle. That was pushing Peter to take a step of faith. Go a little bit deeper from shore. And then he started preaching. And then when he come back in verse four, he said now to Peter, put out into deep water. You see, you gotta go, you gotta leave the shore of a place, the lake where you don't have any fish. And you gotta start moving deeper into the lake. But you see, it takes faith to go deeper into the lake. Because when you stay at the shore, you're still standing on your ground, you're still in your comfort zone, and you have control over your life. Even though water is touching your feet, but you're still standing. But just like Peter, go a little bit inside. And Peter like, oh, oh, right? It's like going in the ocean, yeah, you feel the waves, like, okay, good. And Jesus is preaching. And then he comes back and says, go now into deep. You know what it means? You gotta go to a place where you can't stand anymore. You're losing ground. And then now you're floating on the water. What about if you don't know how to swim? <laughs> to the same Peter that he said, come out of the boat. 
Come out of the boat. If you are I'm Jesus, come, come out of the boat. Come, come. Peter said, okay, outside of the boat. The water is not strong. It's not concrete. And he, he puts his feet. Because you say, so Jesus, I'm going to try. And, and everybody's in the boat. James, Thomas, and all the apostles. Peter, don't do that. Ooh, that's silly. You're going to drown. Peter said, Jesus says so. I'm going to obey. Uh -huh. Oh? Oh? Jesus said, like, oh, don't look back. Don't look back, Peter. Come on, come on. Stay focused on me. You can do it. Okay. Okay, Lord. Okay, Lord. Uh. Oh. All right, Peter. You don't walk like that, Peter. You don't walk like that. Stand normally. Okay, oh, Jesus, because you are so okay. Now come. Oh, no. Yeah. Come. All right. Uh-oh. I'm walking in water. Oh, oh, oh wow, this is cool. I'm walking in the water. Uh, all right, go in the deep, deep, deep. And then all of a sudden, the storms. God sent the storms. Peter said, oh, Lord, Lord, oh, no, don't look back. Don't look at the clouds. No, don't do that, Peter. Oh, oh, oh he was sinking. <laughs> Maybe it's time for you to go deeper to this morning. Put out into the deeps. That's where you get the amazing catch from God. You see this morning for you to do that? You got to make the decision today to leave the shallow water of lukewarmness. Revelation chapter 3. You got to leave the shore of lukewarmness and go into deep, the deep water of commitment to Jesus. Revelation chapter 3 from 15 to 17. The Bible says over here, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold or hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I'm rich, I have acquired your wealth, and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are rich, rich pitiful, and poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and soft to put on your eyes so you can see. Maybe it's time to leave the shore of lukewarmness. And lukewarm means indifference, half-hearted commitment to God, a pathetic way of serving God, lack of conviction, no enthusiasm, no excitement in your Christian walk. Is that the way you're feeling this morning? No energy, no joy, no excitement? Let me give you the bad news. You are lukewarm. Come on, bro. When you wake up in the morning, you don't feel like reading your Bible. You are lukewarm. When you only pray because somebody called your attention about your prayer life, you are lukewarm. When you start praying and the only things that can come out of your mouth is, oh Lord, I don't know if I can survive Christian life, you are lukewarm. If you're on your knees and you're sleeping. <sighs> oh, okay. Jesus, uh, good morning, sir. No, uh, good morning, dad. Uh, you are lukewarm. You see, when you're always walking around people, but you never invite one of them to come to church, you're lukewarm. Come on. When it's time to give contribution, and then you feel that pain in your back, because your money is not gonna come out. You're struggling to bring that money out. It's like going to the dentist to remove that tooth, and you're like, my money, can get it, got your lukewarm. It's time to leave that show because if you stay there, you're gonna starve to death. And it is not somebody else's responsibility. Only you can move deeper. Come on, bro. You can't expect the conviction of all the disciples to carry you through. No, you can't expect somebody else, your disciple, the church leader, to take you over there. You gotta move yourself deeper inside. 
Are you going to do that? This is a year of your challenge. You got to make it happen today. Amen, church? Amen. You got to move away from the shallow waters of unbelief. You read the Bible, but we don't really believe God promises. You read again and again the same verses, great promises. If you have faith like a mustard seed, you can tell that mountain, move from there and throw yourself into the sea. If you don't, believe, if you don't doubt and believe that what you say is going to be true, then God is going to make that miracle happen for you. Do you believe those scriptures? We read the Bible, but we don't really believe. We go to God with our burdens. We pray for two hours sometimes. Lord God, you know, I'm tired of carrying these burdens, Lord. And Jesus is like, put it at my foot. You're like, okay, Lord, okay, I'm putting it down. Okay, I'm not going to be stressed anymore. I trust you to give me joy. Thank you so much for spending the time with me, Lord. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. And then you carry your burden again. Bye-bye, God. See you tomorrow. So you walk inside your prayer time like this. And then you're coming out like this. Unbelief. Believing God means I believe whatever God says, I believe it. Only the Bible is true. I don't believe in my emotions. I believe in Jesus and the Bible. I am what the Bible says I am. I am not what the circumstances say I am. I am not what my emotions tell me I am. Your emotions might be telling you, you're a wreck, you're, you're nothing. Maybe that's what the circumstances are telling you. Maybe that's what somebody told you when you grew up. You're nothing, you're stupid, you can't do anything. I don't care what people think about me, what God says about me, it's true. Come on. I can do what God says I can do. I possess what God says I possess, and I can achieve whatever God says I can achieve. I don't care if I have a degree or not, if God says so. After all, I was not there when he spoke the universe into existence. He said only one sentence, let there be like. And we have billions of galaxies. The same God can speak in your life and turn things around. Do you believe? It's time this morning to move into the deep waters of faith. Come on, bro. Leave the shallow waters of unbelief. You gotta leave the shallow waters of lack of commitment. You gotta leave the shallow waters of greed and financial idolatry. Malachi chapter 3. There's a strong promise from God over here for those who give generously to God. He says, chapter 3, from verse 8. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse. Your whole nation. Because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgate of heaven and pour out so much blessings that there will be no room enough to store it. Wow. What an incredible promise. But you see, we live in a land of plenty. I've traveled, I've been to the United States maybe 35 times already. I've been a preacher for 23 years. And I've been to Africa almost everywhere. I've been to Europe and I can compare. Now I'm, I'm speaking to you with a perspective. Come on, I'm wondering why if we are, we are all sinners, why will God bless some other parts of the planet more than others? Mm. If we all deserve to die because we are all sinful. If he doesn't have a purpose, that is more important than our own enjoyment and selfish pleasures. Why is it that the United States is more blessed than all the countries on the planet? Why do people need to have three cars in the United States, you know, more food that they can eat, and they always throw away food, and they, they, they are bored in a lot of materialisms, and you know, you have a medical insurance, you can go to a doctor if you want to. Love is so good, no mosquitoes. Why is it that mosquitoes have to be in Africa? I can't believe that. <laughs> this is not fair. You enjoy your patios, you open, I mean, yesterday I was, you know, at uh, Chris' house, and then we came out, I'm looking at the stars. No mosquitoes is biting me. I cannot do that in Africa. I have to always stay behind the screens. Why? Why is it that the weather sometimes is so good over here? You know, you guys can see the snow. And I never saw the snow in Africa. Why? Why are you so blessed? 
Do you understand that God has a purpose beyond the blessings he's giving you? But if you are not connected with God, you can use God's blessings for unspiritual things and matters, for your selfish desires. And people are suffering. We have a lot of money over here, a lot of things. And I've been to hospitals every time, most of the time in Africa, just to be cured for malaria. But sometimes you don't want to stay at the hospitals because there's no room. Some people have to lie down on the floors. And you got to wait for a doctor. Sometimes you can wait for four hours, five hours. There's no doctor to see you. And uh, people die because they don't have $10 to buy the drugs. I remember two years ago, a sister that we love very much, she was pregnant. And she went to the doctor. She was about to give birth. But there was a complication. And they asked her to put 400 US dollars on the table so that they can do the surgery and save the baby. But she does not have any $400 in her pocket. She does not have any bank account. But in Africa, you don't have money. The doctors are like, who is the next? So she went back home with her pain and she couldn't find 400 US dollars and they were expecting their first baby. They were married only for two years. She couldn't find that $400. And guess what? She was struggling for her life and the baby was dying. She went back to the hospital, begging the doctors, please, my baby's gonna die, I'm suffering, I'm in pain. They're like, do you have $400? She couldn't afford. And then she collapsed, the baby passed away, the baby came out, dead. And the doctors are like, okay, uh, with her pain and bleeding, they're like, can you take the dead body of the baby out of the hospital? We don't have room to keep the baby. Wow. So she had to take the baby back home, crying with her husband, and they had to find a place to bury the baby. And how much are you throwing away over here? Every year you need to have a new iPad? Every six months? Wow. I heard that some of you guys, you have to queue Every time there's a new version that's coming out, you can spend the night at the store just waiting for your new version and it's going to cost you 2,000 US dollars or 1,000 US dollars. And then now you're walking in the street feeling somebody and everybody has to see your new iPad because you're walking like this. <laughs> and there's a smile on your face. You are worshipping an idol. You can't even have conversation with anyone because you're so busy with your new iPad. <laughs> new iPad. Oh, don't, don't fall down. Oh, 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 oh. I almost my eyes. <sighs> my iPad. That's how you sleep? When you're going to church, you have your iPad. Whatever, wherever you are, your iPad is there. You're having a conversation with Scott. <laughs> iPad. iPad. And then some of you, you're praying to your iPad literally. Holy heart, can you take me to where I need to go? Oh, hi, part. Can you give me direction about my life? When somebody can have four hundred dollars to save a baby? Wow. Wow. American pet owner break last year's record for money spent on pets. The American Pet Products Association released its annual report on pets spending on March 13. We showed that Americans spend 55.7 billion on pets in 2013. Wow. This figure represents an increase of 4.5% from the 53.3 billion spent in 2012. Where did all this money go? In Sierra Leone? In Abidjan, in Congo, to feed the poor? No. The spending boom has much to do with the large variety of products and services available to pet owners, ranging from interactive and innovative toys to dog walking, doggy daycare, and pet friendly hotels, restaurants for pets, and airlines. Food for pets. They spent 21.6 billion feeding pets. 
about one million more than the previous year. Oh, healthcare for pets, surgery for pets, over-the-counter medicine, 13 billion dollars for pets, and 4.5 billion for what? Other services including grooming, boarding, pet sitting, and training. And then we go to church on Sunday. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all the blessings that you've given us. Don't get me wrong. I love animals more than some of you in this room. <laughs> I used to have in my house in Africa 70 rabbits. I started with four. If you want to learn a lesson about making disciples, you buy rabbits. <laughs> In six months, you will understand how to be a fisherman. <laughs> I had a peacock. I love animals. But should my animals be more important to me than my neighbors that are suffering? Come on, bro. Are you going to take your pet to heaven when you die? There's something wrong with our society. I think we became idolaters, greed. We don't want to give, we don't want to share. And our houses are always full of stuff. Extra room, full of stuff. The stuff that you're keeping since high school, that you're not using. But you feel an emotional attachment to your things. So you can't give them away. You gotta store them. Come on. And every day you open that room, you say, my stuff, my stuff, my stuff. I love your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> 2009 stuff, 2008 stuff, 2005 stuff, 2004 stuff, 2003 stuff. When my grandma was alive, when my great 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 grandmother was giving me this bike, stuff, stuff, stuff. And we don't have enough stuff in America to spare all that we have. And this is a new business booming. Storage, public storage places that you can rent. To put what? More stuff. It remind me of that guy in the Bible. God was blessing him so much, he's like, I'm gonna turn down my bounds and build a new one and put all of this stuff there so that I can tell my soul, eat, drink, and be merry. Jesus is like, you fool. You don't know that this night your life is gonna be taken away from you. And what will happen to your stuff? You see, we think we're gonna to go to heaven with all our baggages. So the narrow door, you're like, no, no, narrow door. I'm going to heaven with all this. But while our pets are having surgery, let me read you this report from an hospital from hell. Oh, I wanted to say from Sierra Leone. I'm so sorry. Not from hell, from Sierra Leone, from Congo. Oh, when the door was open, the body was right in front of him. Solidly built young man, Lying on the floor, he's been there all night long. <coughs> Shifting, crying, bleeding. The nurses, some not wearing gloves, and other nurses in street clothes. Clustered by the door, a pool of patients' bodily fluid spread on the ground. A worker in the hospital kicked another man in the floor to see if he was still alive. The man's foot moved and the team kept going. In the next room, a four years old girl lay on the floor in urine, motionless, bleeding from her mouth, her eyes open. And just beside her, a corpse lay in the corner. A young woman, legs shaking, She's about to die. And a small child stood on a court watching as the team took the body away, stepping around a little boy, lying immobile next to black buckets of vomit. Hmm. This doesn't seem like from Sierra Leone. It seems like from hell. And my wife and I were workers for our charity in Africa. And we're going to some of these hospitals where people are dying. And the doctors, there are some rooms where doctors cannot walk in because it smells like hell. There are some rooms in those public hospitals where relatives do not walk in. And disciples need to go there and 
help these people that are dying from HIV. I still remember like it was yesterday, all these people lying on those beds with a lot of prescriptions at the head of their beds. Nobody is buying it and they are looking like zombies. You can count their bones. Their eyes are wide open. They've not been touched by anyone for the past three weeks, four weeks. And they can't move anymore. They can't get out of bed to go to the toilet. So the doctors are very ingenious. They make holes on the bed and they put a bucket underneath. So they're doing all their stuff in it. So as Patricia is walking in with other sisters to try to help out, the smell is so intense that you can faint. I don't even have the strength to follow them. And now when they come, they have to move these people from that bed and their back is glued to the bed. And when the Bible talks about worms eating you alive in hell, is that the difference? When they turn those people, they're screaming, ah, screaming, and then all of a sudden they look at the back, there are worms in their back. And then disciples now have to pray to Jesus, and these people that are crying in pain, and they're smiling, and they're looking at their faces, are you angels? Somebody asked one day, are you angels? And they try to clean, and they say, sir, we're gonna, we have some food for you. And by the time they go out to try to find some food or the drugs to come back to help, they pass away most of the time. Wow. Those places exist on planet Earth. I've seen it. I'm an eyewitness. Hey, are you complaining about what? You're not happy? You're about to fall away? Because somebody hurts your feelings? Wow. You can't go to this church anymore? Nobody loves me? You can't reach your Bible because you're mad at God. Your girlfriend left you. Man, I've not been on holidays. I'm struggling in America. There's been two years I didn't go to Cancun to rest. I can't take it anymore. I have to smoke drugs. I'm suffering. Really? Really? Some of, some of your issues makes me want to laugh. But because of respect, I go, <laughs> sorry, bro. <laughs> what are you doing, Blaze? <laughs> because compared to what people go through, you are blessed. You should be thankful to God for your own struggles. Because even in your struggles, you're still among the 2% of the world population. That is privilege. Does that make any difference in your life this morning? Yeah. It's time to leave the shallow water of greed. Wow. Give. You're not making any favor to God when you give. Some people are giving to God like, they, it looks like a favor, you know? And then preachers are to come behind you, say, bro, please, if you don't give, the church is gonna fall apart. Please, bro, give, please, please, bro. Don't leave us, if you do that, the gospel is not gonna be preached. Please, bro, you're like, okay, okay, talk to me tomorrow, talk to me tomorrow. I'll figure out. Next day, hey, bro, you bothering me, man, this preachers, this church. What do you want? We need money for staff, for this. <laughs> right, okay. And then now you come to church, Is that what you want? Take it. Take it. And leave me alone. Glory, glory. Special contribution to send money in Haiti, Africa with it. Some people will miss church that Sunday. Bro, where are you? I'm weak. I see you in two weeks. It is a blessing. You're more blessed when you give than more you than what you receive. And I trust God we're all gonna change. Amen. In order to do that, you gotta make the decision this morning to go into the deep water of intimate relationship with God. 
That's what you need. Intimate relationship with God. Then everything will make sense. Exodus chapter 33. Exodus 33. Intimate relationship. You got to make that decision that God is going to be your best friend. Chapter 30, 33. From 10. Here's Moses with God. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the, to the tent, they all stood and worshipped each at the entrance of the tent. The Lord will speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses will return to the camp, but his young heir, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Moses says to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know when you will send me, who you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people, the Lord replied. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to God, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Wow. God, if you're not going to lead me, don't send me out on a mission. I don't want to do it if you're not in my life. You have to be number one. Lead me, Lord. Is that the way you feel this morning? God should be number one. And the Lord says, verse 19, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, okay, because Moses, you really want to see me. All right, there's a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in a rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back. What about that? Moses was like, wow, cool idea. Can you imagine the scene? Then God is like, close your eyes now. I'm about to pass. And everywhere in the Bible where God is going to show up, there, there's an earthquake trembling, the mountains are shaking, there's fire. So Moses is yelling, he said, oh no, no, Lord, I, I can't believe I asked this. Close your eyes. And then God's glory passes by, and God's like, okay, now Moses, open your eyes. And then Moses goes, here is the back of God. Moses has seen the back of God. I can't wait to be to heaven to ask Moses, what did you see? <laughs> the back of God. He's the only human being that I've seen the back of God. Can you imagine? He's coming down from the mountain with an image of God in his mind. Like, what? God? God's back. Brothers and sisters, you need to make a decision this year that you're going to grow close to God. That you're going to see God. You're not going to see him physically, but you can walk with God so closely that absolutely your heart can have God as the first passion of your life. It's time to be intimate with God. When was the last time you went on date with God? Yeah, you can go on date with God. Yeah? So invite God, take him out for lunch. And you sit down, you put a chair in front of you, you sit over here, and then you put two cocks on the table. It's okay, Lord, I just want to be your friend. I want to be close to you, Lord. Man, how was your day, Father? Oh, son, you know, man, I'm dealing with galaxies. The Milky Way is a mess. You know, I'm trying to put all the stars together. Thank you, Dad. You're awesome. But you know what is awesome about having a day with God? You have a double return at the end. You will drink all your Coke, and then at the end of the date, you will drink God's Coke. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't drink Cokes, right? Be creative. You have a lot of mountains around over here. When was the last time you went on a mountain to pray? Just to be with God. When was the last time you went to the beach to pray? Church, it's time to renew our vow to love God with all our heart, strength, mind, and spirits. Will you do that? And when you do that, to finish, you're gonna walk in deep waters of fruit. Come on. You're gonna have abundant fruits. Yep. If you leave the shallow shores and move into the deep, you got to bear a lot of fruit. John 15, 1 to 5, you can read that home. 
And I've experienced that in my life everywhere I've gone. And I remember being in London, and we're all struggling to baptize white people in the church. We have, a lot of, we have a lot of Jamaican people in the church in London, a lot of Nigerian. But what about the British people, white British people? We're all like, nobody's open, you know, you have Romanians, you have people from Russia in London, and we're all like, I don't know if God can make this happen. I went to the GOC and I was challenged by Kip Sermon about, you know, baptizing people from all nations. And I went back and I said, God, I have to walk deep into the waters, deep waters of evangelism, trusting you to help me to bear fruit. I need to meet a white person that I'm going to baptize. And I want to do that today. What about that? And then I went out with God. I was evangelizing only white people, not black people. <laughs> hey, brother, see you tomorrow. It's not your turn today. Where are you from, sir? I'm from Russia. Oh, white. Okay, let's talk. Let's talk. Let's talk. Let's talk. I went for hours and I was tired. I'm like, God, are you going to do a miracle? Come on, I need the white people. Show me your glory. <laughs> and then finally, I saw a young man coming out like this, you know, very confident. And I went to him. I was so tired of begging people to study the Bible. And all these white people, they're looking down at me like, no, we don't have time. I went, hey, sir. Yeah, hello. I need to study the Bible with you. What? I need to study the Bible with you right now. And he went, okay. So what did you say? Okay. Okay, uh, he's like, where? We are at the bus station. Right here, on the road. He's like, okay. Really? We sat down, seeking God. Let me show you the scriptures. Yeah, I'm listening to you. Study, 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 study. He's like, wow, I never saw this. Do you want to do another one? Yes. Oh, discipleship. Jesus is calling you to have a new purpose in life, to leave your family, to love him more than anything. Can you do that? It's difficult, but I will try. Really? Okay, next appointment. Can we meet tomorrow? Yes. In one week, he was baptized. Yeah. A white guy. And then, I was getting confident. About two, three weeks later, I went, wow, man, it works. I can be fruitful. I gotta walk in deep waters. White people can be baptized. <laughs> and I went again, you see, I was confident. And then other day, I saw a preacher in the street, somebody preaching in the street, a white person. Jesus is Lord. I'm like, wow, this guy's sold out. I listened to him, but he's preaching wrong doctrine. You know, he's saying some crazy stuff, but at least he had the heart. And then two Muslim people came, and started challenging him. I walked to the Muslim people, and I'm like, leave him alone. Leave him alone. And he's preaching, at the end I went, thank you so much for your effort, but we need to sit down. I have something more to show you in the Bible. Can we do that? He went, yes, appointment. He came, he studied the Bible, he got baptized. He works. And I started sharing my faith, and many more people came. And then I came to the GLC, keep saying, bro, you know what? This guy came from AT, he's a preacher. His name is Alexi. Can you see if he's a disciple? I opened my mouth, studied about with Alexi. He was a preacher for 20 years. Wow. And then he was convicted that he was not doing it the way God wants him to do. Wow. Then he repented. He got baptized in the GLC. Yeah. And Alexi says, can you come down with me in AT? We can evangelize a lot of people. I'm like, I'm going down. We went down. Just him and me, two disciples. We studied the Bible in one week with over 55 people. In one week, 20 people were baptized. And then I went for a second trip. They took me to four cities in 10 days, night and day, without running water, no place to sleep, you know, life is tough, mosquitoes. 30 more people were baptized, and today, after 17 months, from one man, they have a church of 125 disciples in Haiti. I'm telling you, if you obey Jesus, he's gonna walk even here in Phoenix. I'm looking forward for a year of fruitfulness over here. Every single disciple will be fruitful. Every Bible talk, because we're gonna have to make the decision to leave the shallow waters of commitment to walk into the deep waters Amen. of conviction, of love of God. We're going to leave greeds and materialism. We're going to give to God. And next year, by this time, there will be no room over here to store all the fishes that we have caught together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.